Clearly, I bring my biases right, right. to what I'm doing. The goal is to surround yourself with people who puncture holes in your bias, who can say, you know, you might not see this, but I see this. And, and, and rec so it helps you recognize where you have a blind spot. I don't think newsrooms and I don't think police departments have really done that work of saying, boy, the data is really showing us that there's a problem. Shouldn't we examine why? I mean, we're not horrible people. We don't want to see people suffer. So then what could it be? What is the reason that these numbers exist? You're listening to Staring at the World with Bodine's Kurt Newman, a T. Torrance Productions original podcast. everybody, this is Kurt Newman, Staring at the World podcast. Today I'm going to be talking with Soledad O'Brien, who I've watched on CNN for many, many years. She has had many documentary specials on um, throughout the years, and she's got a new one on HBO called Black and Missing, about black kids, uh, children gone missing, and uh, disproportionate ratio of finding them. And so we talk about her childhood, we talk about growing up, her years on CNN, all kinds of interesting things. So stay tuned. Soledad O'Brien. Everybody, I'm Kurt Newman, and we are staring at the world today with Soledad O'Brien, which I feel like everybody knows who you are from all your years of TV journalism and reporting, I think MSNBC, CNN, Al Jazeera, HBO Real Sports. You've been on our TVs for a long, long time, and we've all watched you and not just reporting, but your documentary series that you've had on, Black in America and Latino in America. And now you have your own media company, and you've got a new HBO documentary series called Black and Missing, which is going to be on on uh, an ongoing series on HBO for a while, four-part series, I understand. Is that correct? Yeah, mm -hmm. and we're going to stream it on HBO Max as well. It's funny, some people have said to me it's a really good time. They're talking about the fact that there's been so much attention around the Gabby Petito case, a, a missing white woman, that yeah. it's a, a good time to talk about this issue. But actually, we've been working on this doc for three years. Yeah. Um, it's been an issue for such a long time, actually. Right, right, right. And I was watching some of the clips you sent about it, which was really incredible, um, the statistics that you came up with. You know, I, I, I know that a lot of people go missing in, in this country, and it is a big issue. And, and, but some of the statistics about four times longer than white kids to find them and stuff, you address a lot of that stuff in this documentary. I think it'll be really educational for people to hear about it and watch it. Yeah, you know, it's, it's such an interesting thing because I think for a lot of people, they don't necessarily understand the degree to which uh, black women are overrepresented in the number of people who are missing compared to our, our numbers in society. And that it's, you know, you're four times, takes four times longer for black people to be found or to have some conclusion to the case than their white counterparts, which really doesn't make a lot of sense unless you start calculating, you know, disparities in race and, and what, sort of being ignored and being less valued, that the, the cost of that, if you will, from a, a law enforcement perspective, from a, a media perspective, which I've, I've been in those newsrooms, so I've, I've been in those conversations, and also from a, a community perspective, that if everybody doesn't really value the lives of especially these young Black women who are missing, then, you know, how can you expect anybody else to you know, want to do round the clock coverage of it if, if sort of we don't think that there's a value? Yeah. How did this project first come to you anyways? Like, I mean, what brought your interest to it? Did somebody approach you about it or did you go out looking for it or what happened? A little bit of both. We have a good development um, division in my, uh, in my organization. And uh, one of my colleagues, a guy named Patrick Conway, uh, reached out and said he'd just been following these two amazing women, Derricka and Natalie Wilson, who are right. sisters-in-law. And I knew them because they had been honored by Black Girls Rock. And uh, eventually it did come down to me sort of begging them to take part in the documentary because, you know, immersive docs are hard. 
Yeah. They take a lot of time. You right. really commit to someone camping out with a camera in your face. You know, and, and my experience has been, um, you know, the first couple of days, everyone's very excited. And then the next couple of days, it's like, huh. And then the, after that, it's kind of annoying. Um, but we had to camp out with them for a long time to really capture what they do and how they work and to see where cases would go. So um, once we were able to get them on board with having us follow them around, you know, then we started shooting and then a pandemic happened, which was kind of crazy yeah. um, for everybody, uh, obviously. Yeah. Um, but, you know, in a lot of ways, um, the pandemic made things yeah. much worse for them. You know, uh, domestic violence, which is highly correlated with people who are missing went up yeah. and, um, and people were under more stress. Uh, so they've been incredibly busy over the, the three years that we've started working with them. I couldn't help wondering when I was reading about this, um, is it, I mean, maybe you know this answer because you, you worked on the documentary and I don't, but did you find it was just strictly based on race or was it some of it, I can't help but believe it's just your economic standing in life, like wealthy people have access to get things done just like, you know, how they influence politics and stuff like that. And do you think that your economic status has a lot to do with how much attention you get for something like this or not? Yeah, for sure. And they're correlated, right? Yeah. We know that race and poverty, while they're sort of separate categories, often are actually correlated as well. You do see, if you look at, I look at it as a sort of three different categories, right? What's the media doing? And what you find is, I find that there is, and our doc found, you know, there's a lot of media bias that young white women, especially if they're blonde and attractive, get a lot of attention, that there's a sense that that's what the audience wants to see. A lot of the leadership in newsrooms, a lot of the producers are white men. And if that's attractive to them, then that's something that they assume is attractive to everyone. And that if they're less attracted to a person, then they're less interested in covering a story. I worked in a newsroom where yeah. when we wanted to put an author on the air, we had a producer who would check out the, the jacket cover, right? Is this person pretty? Because if she's not pretty, I don't even care if her book is good, if she's not pretty, right? right? I mean, that's, that's just the reality of the business that I worked in. On the police side, uh, law enforcement, uh, I think poverty does play a role. I think there is a sense that, um, Either maybe it's not such a big deal if someone goes missing. Often police frame people who are missing as well. Maybe they ran away. Maybe they just went to stay with their boyfriend for a little while. You know, uh, yeah. the Black and Missing Foundation is is trying to remove runaway because it automatically I think brings a lot of disinterest in um, helping find a person. If you think they've just run away, obviously you're going to be less incentivized to be part of helping find them. And then they would also say the Black and Missing Foundation that the community has to push on everybody. What makes uh, these stories get a lot of coverage is, is pushing and, and knowing how to yeah. navigate. I mean, that's why Derica, who knows law enforcement, and Natalie, who, who has a background in PR, they literally help families who may not have the access, right? Who don't have the exposure, who can't call up the friend of a friend who works at NBC right. News and say, hey, boy, do I have a story, who, who may not know the best picture to pick or what to wear when they're doing Good Morning America, right? That, that they, they might you know, need some help on this front. And I think Derek and Natalie decided to use their personal skills to really help families ne negotiate and navigate better. Yeah, because um, you know it's like the worst thing you can imagine is your kid going missing somehow. Every parent feels the same way. It's just like, it's devastating. Did you, were you able to find out anything about like who's taking these kids or is there any answer to that question yeah. of what's going on? A lot of domestic violence, a lot of sex trafficking, yeah. which again is why this idea of runaway is such a bad way to think about it. Because right. we know, especially for young women, um, you know, uh, if you're being sex trafficked, you might think you're meeting up with your boyfriend, but in fact, you're not meeting up with your boyfriend. You've walked into something that you don't know. Um, and so those two things uh, are hugely, hugely um, problematic and highly correlated. Uh, so I, I think for what the Black and Missing Foundation is trying to do is one, raise awareness, but also just make sure, I mean, it's, it's interesting, right? If you had to do a missing poster of someone you love, like, how would you do it? What would be on it? You know, for a lot of families, they don't know how to negotiate and navigate that. And, yeah. and so they help them even with the most basic things so that they can get a leg up in having their loved one found. Right. Because really the police aren't finding them. It's really up to 
you to try and get attention wherever you can to get the word out to a larger audience somehow to to find your kid. And I, again, I guess and it puts pressure on the police, right? If everybody, if every newsroom is calling you and saying, yeah. hey, we want to ask about yeah. uh, Ashley Smith. We want to know about uh, Shaniqua Jones. Well, guess what? The police department says, you know, what's going on with this case? We're getting a bunch of calls from the media. The same way if people call the media and ask, the media will say, well, who's this, who's this person we keep getting phone calls about, right? We know it's a, it's a, it's a cycle. And if there's pressure in one place, it, it actually does make a difference in coverage and attention and in how someone can be found. I mean, Derica tells a story about being a police officer herself and not realizing she was on her way to a domestic violence call and not realizing that she sees two people walking kind of weirdly, suspiciously. And as she pulls up, the girl runs to her she, in fact, is the victim in this domestic violence incident, uh. but she's also been missing. But no one had ever told the police department next door, essentially, in the next jurisdiction. So they weren't looking for her. And, and it was the most horrific story, but she's like, it was a complete accident that I came across this. I could have just driven by. I didn't know she was missing. I, you know, we were able to uh, save her, but we, we didn't know she was missing. She was with her abductor in a hotel room. Yeah. And I think uh, uh, a lot of times I've seen stories before where um, girls in particular will believe they're meeting up with some guy who may be someone who cares about them. And he, and he does turn out to be just someone who's going to sex traffic or make a profit off these girls. And it's a huge problem. I mean, it's going on constantly. So it's amazing that you've done the work for the documentary to get the word out on this because I think it's a great step forward for every parent to be aware of, to watch this and pay attention. Yeah, it's kind of terrifying. It, it really is. is. It really is terrifying. I mean, and your heart breaks. I remember I've covered the Lacey Peterson case, the Elizabeth Smarth case, yeah. the Natalie Holloway case, you know, and you, you watch the family member. It is so painful to watch them. It's so brutal to think of what they're doing. But at the same time, I mean, in the documentary, we talked to a woman who's looking for her niece and she's saying, you know, her niece was missing a, a couple of weeks before Natalie Holloway went missing. She says, you know, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't get any attention from my niece. She was a beautiful, young Black woman. Natalie Holloway is a beautiful, young, yeah. white woman, but no one was interested in telling my niece's story. And this was a woman who knew how to navigate TV news. And she's like, I literally cannot get any attention for someone who's also missing. Why not? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a big question. I don't know. That's a tough one, but um, you're you're kind of saying I think that the news, in general, the the broadcasters kind of have a bias towards whatever their audience is, and so they're going to kind of cater to that audience as far as what they put out there. I think, I think we all bring biases, right? I mean, oh, yeah. you know, I have a bias toward for some reason, and I'm not sure why. A uh, 65 year old white dude, economists. Like if you asked me to book an economist for your podcast, <laughs> I would come up with some really great 65 year old white dude. And my producers on the show that I anchor are always like, why, why that guy? <laughs> you know, there, there are other people who could, who could contribute who are not 65 year old white dude economists. Yeah. And, and it, we laugh, right? Because that's obviously, I grew up on the Today Show. That's very typical for a Today Show guest. Yeah. Clearly I bring my biases right, right. to what I'm doing. The goal is to surround yourself with people who puncture holes in your bias, yeah. who can say, you know, you might not see this, but I see this and, and, and wreck it. So it helps you recognize where you have a blind spot. I don't think newsrooms and I don't think police departments have really done that work of saying, boy, the data yeah. is really showing us that there's a problem. Shouldn't we examine why? I mean, we're not horrible people. We don't want to see people suffer. So then what could it be? What is the reason that these numbers exist? But I haven't seen any newsrooms that are really interested in doing right. that. In fact, in our documentary, we talked to a, a, right. a news, news president who says race is not a factor in our coverage. That's yeah. just not true. That yeah. is just absolutely not true. Right. They're chasing ratings because, you know, they're driven by advertisement and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's it's a it's a complex situation. Can we talk a little bit about you and and your background from the first time I've ever seen your name? I was 
I was confounded by your name because Maria de la Soledad Teresa Barquetti O'Brien. The Blessed yeah. Virgin Mary of uh, everyone, Solitude. Everyone I grew up with was confounded by my name too. <laughs> yeah, because you see Soledad and you see O'Brien, you're just like, I struggled to put them together. But then when I, yeah. for this interview, I read about you and then I was like, oh, okay, this is interesting to me. Your early years and your parents and interracial, like marriage wasn't even legal when they wanted to get married and stuff. Now, can you talk a little bit about your childhood for us as far as what sure. it was like growing up in that type of setting and how much that may have influenced in where you went in life? Yeah, yeah. You know, I grew up in, in Long Island, in a town called Smithtown in Long Island on the North Shore. And in a lot of ways, Smithtown is a fantastic place to grow up. It's very suburban, safe, nice, kind of boring if you're a teenager. Uh, and my parents moved there um, from Baltimore because interracial marriage was illegal in the state where they were living in Maryland. Uh, in fact, was illegal until my little brother, the sixth child of theirs was born, 1967. That's when the Supreme Court overturned the ban on interracial marriage. So my parent, my dad got a job as a professor, moved to Long Island and Long Island was just that part at that time, 1960s, 1970s, 1980s when I was in high school, not particularly diverse. And on one hand, I thought my childhood was fantastic. I'm very close to my brothers and sisters. I had a great childhood. I got a great mm -hmm. education. My parents, like a lot of immigrants, uh, my dad uh, was, they pa my parents passed away a couple of years ago, but my dad was uh, white and Australian. My mom was black and Afro-Cuban. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of immigrants sort of have that, you're in this community, put your head down, plow through, get out of it what you can. And they both are very focused on education, good public schools. And so that's what we did, me and my siblings. You know, we, we got great education, I had good friends. Um, but there certainly weren't conversations about diversity. And there was lots of, you know, incidents, nothing horrifically major, where you just weren't really made to feel particularly welcome because it was not particularly diverse. And, you know, there's a, a very big history actually of the KKK in Long Island. Mm -hmm. I mean, my parents couldn't buy a house in Long Island when they first moved there because right. realtors wouldn't sell to an interracial couple or a black couple. People were very clear. They did not want people to move into the community. Um, you know, so... So it's weird, right? Because in, in some ways it was a fantastic childhood, safe. I had a great childhood. I, I, my neighbor had a horse and I got to jump on that horse and I became a good rider eventually. And, you know, so great childhood, but also like kind of weird in a lot of ways, you know, you you're not feel that. Dating. You feel it yeah. as a kid though, when you're young and, and you struggle to understand what's going around you a lot of times. But so I was just imagining in the sixties at that time with your parents, you must've just had those moments where you just felt like something's different here and how much that like, got to you to to make you want to do something like because I couldn't help but think as getting into journalism like you wanted to tell stories and I wondered how much uh your childhood would have influenced some of that you know for Definitely, you Definitely, I think yeah I think for my my mom particularly I mean both my parents I think they my mom you, you used to tell me the story about how uh, people would spit on our family when they would walk down the street together in Baltimore I wasn't born yet yeah. And I was so horrified, like they'd spit on you, my older sisters, my mom and my dad. And she used to say this thing, like, you know, yeah, lovey, because she calls me lovey, love called me lovey. Um, she said, America was, we knew America was better than that. And I think that piece of it, this idea of, oh, so if you want to see change, you can't really opt out. And that you actually have to be part of pushing change forward in some capacity. You know, and so even though their marriage was illegal, even though people would spit on them, they went on to have four more kids, you know, in a, in a, in a country that at that time was not particularly hospitable to them. Uh, they went on to kind of ignore what people were saying, uh, you know, which is so it's hard to imagine now. But I, I do think a lot of my coverage around race that I'd spent a lot of time focused on was this idea of. I think it's complicated for people. And I think we have an opportunity as journalists to explain issues and dig into data and undergird a good story with a lot of data so people can understand what's happening in the country as opposed to what I think we experience currently, which is a lot of screaming about critical race theory or racism without a lot of historical context to help people really get the conversation. Yeah, yeah. because. Reading about your childhood, I just thought this is this is a classic American story. You know, this is this is what America really was. We don't like to 
face it as much, but it was immigrants, you know, whether we want to face it or not. That's that's what we all are here. And and your story is, is a really classic one. I mean, in that it was large. It wasn't just like typical. My story is far more typical white kid in the, in the suburbs of middle America, you know, and I had my thing for escaping, you know, what I saw, which was to jump into music and stuff like that. But when I'm reading about yours, I was just like, it seemed far more extreme. Like they would have really, um, like I said, want you to push and tell stories about it or address this issue or put it maybe more in a context for people to see this podcast is really about um, what I call a creative element, right? So I'm trying to talk to people about making that creative leap where they went from one place and then into a creative thing that they wanted to do for no other reason than they felt it inside, you know? And so I just yeah, couldn't you know, help My parents that didn't want that at all. They, they, like a lot of immigrants, don't want the stories told, Yeah. right? They literally feel like, listen, don't bring attention to yourself. Keep your mouth shut, put your head down. You yeah. know what? Some bad stuff's going to come, but some good stuff's going to come too. Don't you worry about it. Just keep plowing forward. That is very much the immigrant mentality. Keep plowing yeah. forward. And and so, yeah, I think in a way I was a reaction to that. Yeah. I thought, you know, you talk about your story and, you know, what was the thing that you could use to es escape? And I think in a lot of ways we're similar, right? In a lot of ways, I, I love that the American story is made up of so many of these kind of very, very different, right? But also a, the same. I wanted to get out of boring Long Island <laughs> and yeah. no one wanted to hear me play flute. So it was not going to be through <laughs> my music. It was going to be through what I was good at. And I was a good student. And eventually I was a good writer and a good reporter and I could kind of write my own ticket. But I think, you know, like that's the American experience. What the, this idea that in America you can think about something you want to dream and, and at least back in the 60s, you could think about jumping and, and, and going to it. I think there was more access then than now. But, um, and, and so sometimes I'll tell the story, but we have this great photo of my family uh, from the 1970s. So I'm probably 10 years old. Uh, my mom is black and we were trying to get into our neighborhood, right? So she was very much like, keep your mouth shut, don't speak Spanish, just like, and, so, but this picture is my mom, black, giant Angela Davis Afro. And she used to have a pick that she could wear in her hair. Yeah. <laughs> my dad's white and bald. Yeah. My six brown kids, all of us with Afros. And in the 1970s, of course, there was, you know, polyester, uh, yeah. stripes this way, stripes on your pants. Yeah. And I would think like, oh my God, this was not a family that's blending in at all. Like we're not assimilating our way into this 99.99% town in Smithtown, Long Island, like where we stick out, like we could have gone with the Spanish, you know, because yeah. we weren't blending at all. And whenever I tell that story, I think people laugh because they have a story too, right? And even though our stories are very different, like there is a a similarity to what America allows you to do and become just by virtue of it being America. I mean, that's what's great about this country. Yeah. But we have a real uh, lack of interest in exploring the icky parts and sort of holding ourselves accountable to the, the bad parts, the bad history. And I think that's hugely problematic. But yeah, I, for me, I, I loved writing and I love storytelling. And I would get into newsrooms and think, God, some of the stuff that people are saying is just wrong. Like, I, I know these things aren't true. This is not like if you knew any black people or you knew any Latinos, you just, you know, it was so silly. It made no sense. Yeah. Um, you know, or people would mock how people spoke or people would, um, you know, you just would think like, you clearly don't know any people of yeah. color because like, what are you talking about? Um, you know, and so I think that was where I wanted to be creative. Like, say, I think you're wrong. There are these communities that you just don't know. That it's I almost can help like you were using both. I, I think you, were, you you used your mentality of pushing through that your parents had taught you, right? You, you get your education and you push through, but you also wanted to break out and tell the story or kind of your truth of what you knew, your experiences in life, which it seems to me, you know, you you do in these documentary series that you put out, you're kind of speaking more to your, what you know and what you see, what you've experienced, but you're still pushing through and you push through all the way to get yourself on TV, all the way up to CNN, which was, you know, a giant and HBO, some of the biggest broadcasts you can get on. That took a lot of effort 
to get there. I mean, what do you have any good stories for us is about what those years were like as far as what you had to go through to get your stories They were told? amazing. And sometimes, I'll give you a great story. Um, so when I joined CNN, I remember a producer said to me, I'd been there not very long, and I just had my twin boys. And a producer, we were, the, the tsunami happened in 2004, and a producer said to me, I was going to uh, Thailand. Um, and first I got called to kind of say like, listen, I know you're a new mom, so you're not gonna wanna go to Thailand. And I was like, absolutely, I wanna go to Thailand. Number one, CNN is a network where you travel. That's, that's the job, yeah. that's how you get promoted. So obviously I do, uh, but also I was so tired from having twins. I had four kids under four, I was like, wow, I was like, that's brutal. get out of here. <laughs> that's I was brutal. exhausted. But I remember getting to Thailand and the producer said to me, I want you to know, you might be some kind of star here at CNN, but if you can't hack this, I'm going to put you on a plane back to New York. Mm. And I was like 38 years old. Like, you're going to put me on a plane as if I need to, like, I mean, it was like being spoken to like you're 12 years old or something. It was so crazy. And I remember being so upset. And I don't think that producer, I'm sure of it, would have spoken to a man that way. I think he felt very free to sort of explain to me how he saw this going. Uh, I, I was, I am a crier when I get upset. <laughs> so <laughs> I was like, call my husband crying. And he gave me great advice, right? His advice was, there's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can really do. What you have to do is to just do the work, right? Like the same version of plow through, put your head down and plow through it. He's like, you could call your bosses and complain, but no one's going to care. Yeah. You, you actually just have to go now and show what you can do. And we won a bunch of awards, obviously, for our coverage there. Um, but but you definitely had a lot of, right, a sense of, um, you know, that person was very empowered to, to tell me what, you know, uh, when someone tells you they're going to put you on a plane, like you're a child, and yeah. you are nearly 40 years old, like that's, yeah, yeah. No, that's no. a lot. Uh, and and th that was not an unusual experience. And so I, I do think for women of color, certainly in newsrooms, there's a lot of both navigating, like, how am I not annoyed and angry all the time and friendly and smiling? I'm a generally happy person, yeah. but also kind of dodging barbs and things that come at you from little side angles that are exhausting to deal with. Yeah, I read that. One of the favorite things I, I read an interview that you did where you, I think they were asking you how you identify yourself or, and, and you said, I'm a wife, I'm a mom, I'm a working mom, journalist, reporter, executive producer, that you wear different hats on different days and yet you have to be all of those things at once. And, and so the job uh, uh, of, in your case, reporting the news, but in what we do, you have to kind of be all those things at once and you have to be able to uh, juggle them, which has got to be difficult when you're on a large broadcast like CNN or doing things like that, or even a way doing the documentary series. Yeah, that's got to be extremely difficult. Yes, and also I'm just so lucky. Like, it's very hard for me to complain, and I've tried to really make sure my kids get this, and I think they do. You know, here in New York City, you are heading to the subway, and you look over, and there's a woman who's carrying a baby, who's got a stroller, and also is holding a toddler's hand, right? And you just think, like, now yeah. that's hard. Yeah, it is. That's hard. It's you know, and we're all going for the subway. And, you know, usually there's three people who are hopper get that stroller down, but it's just hard. And and I think I've always was very lucky because by the time I had kids, I had a good job and yeah. you could afford actually to, to buy help. You could afford to, to get support. And then that was not a small thing. That was actually incredibly important. It's what allowed me to take advantage of. If I wanted to go to Thailand to do a story, well, you know, my husband would stay with the kids along with a babysitter, you know, who would, who would stay and help. And, yeah. and that's not small if you're trying to build a career. So, so yeah, of course, I think for everybody, the juggle is really hard, but I think if you don't have the resources for support, it's, it can sometimes just be overwhelming. I think it's why we're seeing the numbers in the pandemic that were post-pandemic, mid to post-pandemic that we're seeing of people, you know, the great resignation, right? People yeah. <laughs> are just exhausted and they are not, it's, it's, it's sometimes not maybe worth it to work as hard as you do and give all your money to a sitter because we don't really have a very good daycare system, uh, childcare um, setup. Uh, it's just hard. It's really, really hard to be a working parent, frankly. 
Yeah, and for me, um, watching my parents get up before dawn and go to work each day, it was really something that struck me even way back when, when I was a kid that made me feel I, I didn't think I could do something like that. I knew I had to do something different, you know, and uh, and it, I was going to die trying, kind of, if whatever it took to do that, that would be more fulfilling. I, I, I would like to talk about something, too, and get your feelings on it here, and this ties into what I'm talking about as far as um, the kind of divide that we have going on in America today between extremes of every sort. You know, we talk right and left a lot, but there's so many different extremes and so much finger pointing. And I don't know if the pandemic made that worse or not, but I know it's in bad shape right now. I talking about playing music, you know, I go out and play these shows and I really see music as something that can kind of bring people together in a way that we really seem to be struggling to do right now in, in America. And can you talk to me a little bit about your feelings about that? You make a lot of these documentaries and they do a lot of good, but uh, how do we solve some of this divided America that's going on right now? And, and I'm doing my little music part, but what can we do on a bigger, per, broader yeah. perspective to do that? It's, it's very challenging and very scary. And I think America's divided, but I think often the media, and I love the media, I love, love, love journalism, but I think often the media exploits that divide for good TV. Mm. So for example, it's just cheaper and it's relatively easy to put on two feuding congressmen, you know, on your newscast than to actually say, today we're going to dig into this issue and explain it. I mean, I always thought of the job in journalism was to explain things to your audience to, to make things less complicated, to, to untangle them. And so what we found when we started doing the show, uh, the Sunday morning show that I do called Matter of Fact, right. was that we could actually, you know, everyone would talk about an issue, but they wouldn't necessarily even understand the basics of the issue. You know, what is the First Amendment? When the president's sworn into office, what does he actually swear to? What's gerrymandering? Everyone's talking yeah. about it, but like, what is it actually? Right, right. And you realize like, Nobody knows. So we could really provide a service in explaining as opposed to taking two very polarized sides, right? And sticking them on camera so they can yell at each other for five minutes, which is highly dramatic. We could actually have an expert walk you through. Let me explain to you what it is. Here's where it came from. Here's why it's called this. Here's how it's working. Here's where we see it. And it's such a much more thoughtful and intelligent way, I think, to look at the news than just bring, you know, book two people to scream at each other. Uh, the, my version is more expensive. <laughs> um, yelling versions are much less expensive. And it's, you know, and, and listen, when I worked in cable news, the greatest thing that could happen was your guests would get mad and whip off their mic and throw it down and storm off the set, right? Like that's good TV, good TV. So I, I, I really feel like part of helping in a divide is to explain things. Yeah. There's so much screaming around issues versus elevating. We, when I do a story on NASA, we do a lot of work with NASA and space. I don't put, there's no other side. Yeah. And I don't say, you know, thank you for joining us, astronaut, you know, uh, Jane Doe. Yeah. Now let's turn to Bob who believes the earth is flat. <laughs> like we just don't do that. We just don't do it. You know, and so we don't elevate, you know, those two sides as if they're equivalent, they're not. And, and I think in news, everything is set up as a, as a fight because it seems like good TV or worse, and this is where I think our political media really fails us, it's set up as a, as a game, as if they're not actual people whose lives yeah. are impacted by whether or not uh, the, the moratorium, on, on, a moratorium on evictions is extended. Right, it's kind of a game. Like, who won? Who lost? Who, you know? But who had a good speech? Who had a zinger? Did you get? Did they get that person? Whoa, that was wild. But like, actually, there's a whole bunch of people who are going to take all their stuff and now be out in the street. So maybe we should think about it differently. How we talk about this and how we cover it and how we explain it. So yeah. I'm, I'm constantly frustrated. And so I guess I would say I think the first step is to stop thinking about these things as some kind of a, a game disconnected. From, from human beings and think about these stories that policy is ultimately about human beings. On our show, we stopped having politicians on. If we wanted to talk about homeless veterans, then, you know, 
let's book some homeless veterans and they can tell me about their issues. I don't need to hear from a lawmaker. Yeah, and that's, you, you say human beings and that gets to a point I've been thinking about so much is because I play these shows and people get together at 10 o'clock at night, we're all singing the same song together and nobody's talking about what side they're on and no one's pointing fingers at each other saying, this, you know, this is your problem, This you're doing this, you're stopping this. There's none of that going on. And I was thinking, how do you get that to everyday America? And, and you say human beings. And so I'm proposing another documentary here we could make together called um, yes, like exactly. human Let's beings in America or something where we, could you focus on how we find common ground? Because even when I see people who disagree, I'm, I'm always like, hey, we we all like these real common things. We all agree on that we love our kids. We want to raise our families. We're trying to pay our mortgages. We just want a little peace of mind here and there, you know, and how can we, how can you get that to everyday America the way that these news medias now are spreading just the divisiveness? How can we get a show or something going where we show the common ground between us all instead of just the division? Yeah. And by the way, I think there is a lot of common ground. I, I've given I speeches at, at schools where people will say to me, I remember one woman, she came with a book. She's like, I think your speech is going to be terrible. So I brought a book. Wow. She was in the front, maybe the front three rows. Or something. Yeah. And at the end, she's like, you know what? I thought it was pretty good. Didn't have to crack my book. But, you know, again, I, I think at the end of the day, you know, I, most of the stories that we do are not, I don't know somebody's political leanings. If we're talking about how do you get insulin? Like, I have no idea the person I'm interviewing, like she doesn't say, listen, I'm a Republican and here's how I voted in the last three elections. She says, I have a daughter and she only makes $40,000 a year. She's young, she's starting out in the world. But if she's paying all this money annually for, for insulin, which she needs to live, she'll never get ahead. And now I'm dipping into my savings to help my child. Like, that's just bad. That's just bad policy. How do we fix that? I, I don't really care who she voted for. I mean, in some ways, obviously, at the end of the day, there is an election and people whose positions and policy will make a difference. And you can cover those things as well. But in terms of educating people about the issues, I think we do we in the media don't do enough of that. So people feel like it's always this person on the far side and this yeah. person on the other far side fighting it out. Well, again, drama is good for TV, but it's, I think it overwhelms people. I, I think a lot of those, those it's, myths about what people like and ratings, I, I actually often found those things not to be true. Our, my, my little show, we have about five employees, uh, you know, beats a lot of those shows that think that that they can whip up an audience by having you know the next you know turning now to the next outrage you know mm. but and after this commercial one more outrage before we leave you for the morning you know we just don't do that I think it's doable but you have to not you have to not believe in these myths you know there was there was a myth that black people can't open a movie overseas right and if you're a black star you, you know, it won't sell that has just been proven wrong we all know that's not it's just not true. Yeah. And I think for a lot of these myths about storytelling in the news, you know, those things are just not true, but you have, it takes a while to get people to believe it. Is there a way to do battle uh, with, with, you know, what politicians are doing now to, to capture the news, you know, that like say the most outrageous thing in order to get some news coverage and become a cult of personality kind of on the news and, and then the it's news media is chasing part. ratings. Like what are we, yeah. how do you, it's, I mean, obviously you can do it with your documentary type series but that's we have to do more of it so you need to get you your cameras and follow me around <laughs> yeah. yeah no i think but i think it's exactly right i think i think the the politicians have really figured out like if they get into a yelling debate with someone you know good tv they can just clip that leverage it on social media where there are many many more viewers for them right it can go viral they get the attention that they need and so the the reporter ends up just being a pawn in that game right they were just being used and nobody cares if it was lies or not lies you know yeah. it's just i need you to be the the foil while i do this over here because i'm actually going to cut you out ultimately and just you know use the chunk of me it happens so consistently and the media just doesn't really know how to deal with it they literally can't figure out how to handle a, a president who lied all the time who consistently lied i i, I personally if you lie to me I do not put you on TV again. 
Kellyanne Conway would never be on television again after talking about alternative facts. It's just not a thing, right? I would say that is not a thing. Yeah. And therefore, somebody who, who is signaling and saying overtly that, you know, she is going to lie. She has her own set of facts right there. That should have been shot down. It was not, you know, and yeah. I think it was, Todd was a reporter then and he kind of giggled about it. Truly, he sort of was like, alternative facts. He didn't say, but here at Meet the Press, which has a 50 some odd year history, we actually, that's not a thing. So uh, I appreciate your time. And until, you know, that is something you don't believe, we're never going to have you back. Do you think news Even media, that. with your experience with all the news media, though, do you think they're ever going to be, or anytime soon, are going to be able to come to that place where they can do yeah, the right you know, thing? I don't know if it'll come soon enough, but I, I, I do think audiences are tired of it. Yeah, I do think so. So I don't. I don't think it's engaging. No one feels great after watching a show that's that's all about you know everybody hating each other. And you know the average age of these. I think the average age of the viewer on Fox is is sixty eight. Yeah. On CNN, it's sixty seven. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, so so you you're not going to last if you can't get a younger audience interested. And younger audiences aren't interested in that kind of a news. Younger audiences want. Well, information and context, I think. I think, I think people so. you know, want, want to be informed. They don't want to be stupid. They want to understand the issues. Yeah. And like I say, we have this common ground. We all we have these things that we all believe in. And sometimes it seems like it takes a world war or something to remind us of those things that we are united in and that we actually stand together in and stuff. Not even just as a country, but as a world. What is it going to take for us to stand together as a world? All these are big, big questions that uh, I shake my head at every day looking for answers. And there's real forces working against people getting along. I mean, you know, disinformation yeah. and yeah. misinformation are very real and very oh. intentional. More so than ever, it feels like. I think about, I talk to my audience a lot about growing up, listening to the radio, the AM radio in the 70s and how great everything felt. Now, I'm probably just not remembering everything that was going on at the time because I know there was some bad history as well, but it just felt like the world was so less stressful and I just get worried having kids that the world's getting more stressful instead of less. And how, how can we stop that cycle? Yeah, it's hard, I think, with access to social media. Uh, I think that's a real problem because I don't, I do think kids are largely protected um, about from understanding fully about the world until they're a little bit older. Um, and now I think kids are not protected. I think yeah. they have a very good sense of what's happening. Sometimes, you know, more access to information than even their yeah. parents. Oh, definitely. Well, I don't want to take all your time because I know you have a million. I know what these press days are like where you have a million. They're interviews. a blessing. I'm so glad people want to talk about our project. It's it's so much fun when you spend a really long time working on a doc and then someone yeah. wants to talk about it. I'm so grateful. So thank you for having me. I truly appreciate Everybody it. Everybody tune in, watch Black and Missing on HBO, a new documentary series. Soledad O'Brien, thank you so much for being with us today. I've appreciated what you've done for so long and appreciate you being here with right. me today. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Likewise. So there you have it. Soledad O'Brien talking to her about a lot of interesting stuff from her childhood uh, to her years at CNN about politics today and the divisiveness. I hope you enjoyed the show and I hope you want to subscribe. I'm going to be talking about the creative element with lots of different people. So get this podcast wherever you get podcasts, download it, rate it, subscribe, do all those great things, and take care of yourself. We'll see you soon. Thanks for listening to Staring at the World with Bodine's Kurt Newman, a podcast about creative innovation. Please be sure to download, subscribe, rate, and review, and keep listening wherever you get your podcasts.